Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue our study in the book of James. So if you'd open your Bible or watch the screen, let's study our book of James today. But before we do that, let's make sure that we've confessed our sins and that we're allowing the Spirit to control us so we can benefit the most from our study. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to study your word. We ask that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth, that we might better respond to it, to understand it, and apply it in our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. James chapter 1, verse 19. James shifts subjects again. This time he's going to talk about being a good listener. But as we see James shift subjects, this subject is often related to something he's just talked about or he's going to talk about afterwards. So we want to keep that in mind sometime. He always has a good what they call a train of thought. One thought follows the other. Okay? Today, we start in on a lesson about being a good listener, and then we'll see why it's important to be a good listener as we proceed through this passage. Let's look at the translation of James 1.19. Know this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. The first thing we should understand is that the words know this, they are a command. This is something we are told to do, or told to know actually told to know okay and everyone must be now this again is the expression that expresses what we are supposed to do and then he tells us you must be quick to hear slow to speak and slow to anger. So let's look at this under three points. One, James is telling his readers, his audience, those who eventually read this letter, he's basically saying, be good listeners. Now, if you were to tell somebody to be a good listener, what kind of things would you say they have to do? Yeah, pay attention. Okay. Pay attention. And I, would, I might even add, uh, make sure that you understand the words he's saying. That's why sometimes I have to spend some time in explaining words because if you've never heard that word or you, you don't know what it means, even though you may have heard it, you need someone to explain it to you. And that's why teaching children is always different uh, because they don't have the bigger vocabulary like a lot of adults do. But this also tells us that the way James puts it, not only to be good listeners and pay attention, but that's the thing that we should be doing the most. Hmm. More than what? More than speaking and more than getting angry, you see? So this is what we're to be doing the most is listening. 
Okay. The second thing he's telling us, do not be quick to speak. Do not be quick to speak. Now, why would he say that? Well, let's use some examples. When people interrupt people, they want to be quick to talk, don't they? So they're often interrupting. We might call them interrupters, but we're just going to say they're interrupting. They break into somebody's speaking or they're talking and they interrupt them. They, they butt in is what we use sometimes as an expression. Another reason people are quick to speak, because they're not listening. Yeah, they're not listening. They don't want to listen, so they want to interrupt and tell you what they have to say. And one reason is because they really are not interested in hearing what someone else has to say. Another thing, somebody who's quick to speak, well, maybe you've run across someone like this. They're always talking. Always talking. So they can't keep their mouths shut for a whole minute before they have to say something. So they're waiting for the person to take his breath or end a sentence so they can jump in right quick. And sometimes the person trying to talk doesn't even get to finish what he had to say. This is some of the things I see on television or I used to watch on television. The people get in a debate. They're so rude to each other. You, No one ever gets to complete a thought. Well, do not be quick to speak. All right? So you have these other ideas behind it, too. Third, those who are quick to anger. What does that mean? Don't be quick to anger. Well, obviously it means don't get angry real fast. All right? Don't be angry at those who are talking. Because if you get too angry, you won't listen. And now I'll say that again. If you get too angry, you won't hear what they have to say. Maybe you don't like them or what they've heard in the past. So you get angry towards them and you don't even hear what they have to say. You know, this happens to Bible teachers sometimes. People get so angry because they're offended at what the Bible says that they don't actually hear the rest of the story. So they refuse to listen. And they don't get to hear the truth. Now the other thing this tells us, this doesn't say not to get angry. Now the Bible is clear that we should not have sinful anger. Sinful anger is a type of, type of thing that leads to hate and slander, and that's sin. That's true. You're not supposed to do that. But there are things that people do and things that happen that we can have what we call righteous anger. Okay? Righteous anger. If we see someone go to jail for something that we know he didn't do, we might have ang righteous anger, right? Or if we see someone lie many times and always get away with it, and maybe even get an award because they lied about it, I've seen that happen. Well, you might get angry about it. Especially if you're the one that should have got the award instead. And that is because you are reacting 
to to somebody else uh, somebody else's wrong action. We see the Bible even describes as God getting angry in His wrath. Well, that's because of sin. He sees sin in the lives of people of what they do and don't do. And he brings on discipline sometimes. All right? So, the first lesson that James teaches us about being a good listener is that listening comes first, and that's what we do the most. We're not going to be quick to speak or interrupt, because if we do, we're not listening, and you're not going to be always trying to control things by talking. People who always talk want to control everything. And even if you know they want to control everything and you try to interrupt because they've made their point and it's time for you to say it back to counter their point or maybe even agree with them. When you start to say something, you know what they do? They don't quit talking. They get louder. So they can drown out anybody else talking. That's someone who wants to control. So let's don't be that type of person either. Let's take our turns at speaking. Let people have their say. If that's what you're really doing. You're trying to have an understanding of different views. And do not be quick to anger. Again, make sure you understand the difference between sinful anger... And righteous anger. Sinful anger is actually sin. Where you do not like some something someone's doing, but it may be right in what they're doing, you see. Or you may get angry because someone said something that was true about you. And you begin to hate them. That's anger. I mean, that's hate. I mean, that's sin. You see, all that sin. All right, now, verse 20 helps explain why you don't want to get into sinful anger. Sinful anger. Pretty simple. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. The word achieve means accomplish. Uh, does not does not do righteous things all right it does not perform it's kind of a hard word to uh, define in really simple terms but when you're angry when you're sinfully angry and that's what this is talking about you're not doing righteous righteous things you're not doing the right thing before God so let's put it this way Sinful anger does not equal God's righteousness. I use a big R for that. God's righteousness. And if you're going to react to something that is wrong... Now, now we're looking at, let's look at righteous anger. Even righteous anger should rise slowly. Okay? Even righteous anger should rise slowly so you're not reacting. Now, where has this been leading us? The last two verses. Remember, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, and then it's explained that sinful anger is not doing God's righteousness. Now we come to the next major point in verse 21. Now, before we look at it, let me show you something. When you see the word therefore, Let me write it again. When you see the word therefore,
we are going to look at a conclusion and we could also say the main lesson so when James says therefore he's coming off the last two verses so in verse 21 the first word is therefore therefore and what is he referring to because you are now quick to listen slow to speak slow to anger and you understand that your sinful anger does not accomplish or do God's righteousness in your life therefore here's what you do now having put away all filth and remains of evil with humility receive the word implanted receive the implanted word which is able to save your lives. Let's talk about this. Put away. Let's talk about putting away all filth and remains of evil. You know what put away things means when someone says go put away your toys or put away your clothes or put away the tools that you borrowed or something like that. That means to put it back, doesn't it? Or put it where it belongs. Now, this word also means to lay aside in the sense of giving something up. So it may mean just don't do that anymore. Give that up in your life. And here he's talking about filth. You know what filth is. It's those big dusty things under, underneath your bed. It's the stuff that accumulates behind the cabinet that no one ever moves or under the couch that's too hard to move. It gets really filthy, doesn't it? Well, the word for filth here, literally, it does mean dirt. But it's used as a figure. In other words, it represents something else. And that has to do with what we call moral defilement. Two big words. Of course, moral means that you're following God's law. Defilement means that you're making it filthy. So you're making God's law filthy, and you do that by not obeying it, or abusing it, or corrupting it. Corrupting means that you're doing things that, that makes it not work right anymore. Another big word, vulgar, vulgarity. So what this is saying is, therefore having put away. Now, the way it says this, having put away, means you've already done it. Once you've done this, once you have put away all filth, that means that you're getting rid of it. You're not going to do it. All right? Like you get rid of a bad habit. Therefore, having put away all filth and remains of evil. Well, evil is a big word. I know it's only four letters. But you know what evil means? Evil is even worse than sin, though it includes sin. But evil often has to do, and we've talked about this before, the world and its systems. But sometimes evil can be produced by one person. He may be planning sin. Planning different sins to, to try to do something even worse. Like we see in the Proverbs, he lies behind the bushes. The bad guy hides behind the bushes so he can ambush the innocent person who comes along so he can take his money or maybe his best coat you see so that's planning evil it's premeditated that means they've thought about it they've decided to do it all right so the first part of this verse tells us that once you have put away all filth all that sin and whatever evil is left in your heart, 
in your mind, things that you know were wrong, the, the plans you had. Once you've done all of that, there's something else you have to do. All right? So we could say all of this is the negative. All right? Putting away the filth. the evil. That's all the negative. You're getting rid of this. Now, the next thing we're supposed to do is in the positive. And that starts out the phrase with humility. With humility. What does humility mean? Now, I'm going to tell you what this means. And you try to remember it because you'll see this come up a lot in the Bible. It's an important word in the Bible. We don't talk about it much, probably because a lot of people don't do it very much. But humility, let me give you some examples. If you lived back during the nights and the kings and you came before the king, what did you always do? You bowed. That's right. And what does that sign sh show when you bow? that you're the king's servant or you're the king's subject which means that you're willing to submit you're willing to do whatever he says all right submit i spelled that wrong submit s-u-b-m-i-t so the positive is it starts out with humility you want to submit. You have to have a submissive attitude. So, you've put away, this is already done, you've put away filth, you've already done that, and evil. Notice, this has to be done first. You put away filth and evil. And then, with humility, you're supposed to do something. receive the implanted word well receive you know what that is right that's our first action step right you learn the word you hear the word remember you listen to the word you learn the word you get so you can hear it. All right? And what are you hearing? The implanted word. Well, the thing about this is uh, it, it combines the second and third step together because when it gets implanted, it gets into your heart. It gets into your memory. It gets to where it can change you. So there is belief going on. And then you receive the word. All right. Now, what is implied here, or what is not said exactly, is that it's applied. But that's okay. Uh, James didn't come to my Bible Academy to learn. I'm actually go to his to learn from him. Now, what he's telling us is, is that we have to submit. We have to have a submissive attitude. When we receive the implanted word that goes down into us. So the word that's implanted, it comes down into us and it changes us. But more importantly, as this verse tells us, it saves your lives. Now he's not just talking to one person. James isn't writing to one person. He's writing to a lot of people. Okay? Now, let's talk about this word lives. Let's go to another page first. The word, I'll show it to you in the Greek just to show you some now and then. All right. The, this one Greek letter makes this sound. S-P-S. -S. This is a U, just like it looks like. This is a K 
sound. All right, a k sound. And this here, make it a little bit better, is a e sound. And we pronounce it suke. The English pronunciation, when you put it into English word, is what? P S. Well, I'll start over. P S Y. Psyche or psych. Okay. Now, it says receive the implanted word which is able to save your lives. But I said, let's just look at the word life for a minute. What does that refer to? That refers to your inner self. Okay. And it also includes your body. Hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, you, when you were born, you received a spirit from God, which made you a real person. And this spirit went inside your body, didn't it? Well, once the spirit and the body come together, this is who you are. Okay? Now, let me show you what some people have misunderstood for a long time. Some people use the word soul. The problem with soul is that people usually refer to the word soul as just the in, inward part of a person. They don't understand that it includes both. So I try not to use the word soul. I'll use the word, like I used here, life. Okay? Now, the Bible teaches us, without the spirit, the body is dead. So when the spirit leaves, the body is still there, but it's not going to be working anymore. It's been deactivated. All right? Now, when the spirit is back in the body, it's life. There's lots of scriptures to show this. When, I, when we die, let's go to another page. When you die, If you're a believer, this is a simple question, where does your spirit go? Yes, it goes to heaven, doesn't it? Where does this body go? Well, it'll probably go in a grave, huh? And your spirit stays in heaven until Jesus brings you back. And you know what he brings you back to earth for? One reason is to get your body. But it's not the old body. It's been made. It's been redone. All right? A complete overhaul. So now the body can last through eternity. So you get a eternal body. All right? And then with that eternal body, you continue to live out your eternal life, which means forever. Alright? Now, when Jesus comes back and let your spirit unite with your body, we call that a resurrection. A resurrection. This new body is designed to last forever. So at the resurrection of the saints, when Jesus comes back, he unites our spirits with our new bodies. So what happens is your body, whether it's in the grave or you got drowned in a lake and never found the body, or if you were a soldier and it got blown to pieces and they don't even have pieces, uh, they will come together as a new resurrection body 
so we become ready for eternity. Now, let's go back to what James is trying to tell us. Remember, he says, with humility receive the implanted word which is able to save your lives. So what he's saying is, when you receive the implanted word, the implanted word, what word saves you? Very simple. The message of the gospel. Jesus Christ died for you on the cross. He took your place. He went to be buried because he was dead. And then he was raised. He became alive. He's resurrected. And when you put your faith in him, you put your entire spiritual life into his care for what he's done. Your sins are forgiven. You enter into the family of God and become a child of God. You see? That is your life being saved. Your suke is saved. And not only does the spirit go to heaven, but later you will get a heavenly body. All right? Let's look at that verse 121 one more time, and this time we'll have a completer understand, a better understanding. Therefore, having put away all filth and remains of evil with humility, receive the implanted word, the gospel, which is able to save your lives. Okay? Now, One more thing I want us to look at, and then we'll close. Remember the three action steps? This is what James is writing about. Let's use the words that I used. Maybe you can remember these better. Receive the word. Believe the word. Apply the word. All right? And James is telling us, when you do that, it saves your lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your awesome truth. And we thank you for your spirit. We ask, Father, that we will learn to put off Whatever is left of our old life as an unbeliever, whatever filth there was, whatever wickedness there was, that we'll leave it behind and that we will receive your word. We'll receive it daily so that we too will be saved and be with you forever. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.